In Tulsa, Oklahoma, there's a shameful secret buried just beneath the surface. It's been hidden and barely spoken of for a century. A racist attack. That night, uh, we could see them burning the Negroes part of town. We, we saw them burning it. It was just terrible. And when you see the pictures, the before and after, you know it's like it's a war zone. There's nothing left standing. What sparked this massacre? It was a really scandalous, false narrative about an attempted rape in broad daylight in downtown Tulsa. And how was it kept a secret for so long? I mean, some people were threatened with their very lives if they talked about it. 100 years later, as this nation attempts to reckon with the hateful elements of its past, a search for mass graves and the truth is finally underway. Doing a murder investigation 99 years after the fact is a tremendous challenge. Could the discovery of a pair of old shoes hold the key to unlocking this mystery? We did get to a point where we encountered an interesting discovery. I'm Sunny Hostin, and this is episode one of Tulsa's Buried Truth. Here's ABC's Steve Osinsami. In Tulsa, the sound of new construction is music to the ears of city leaders. The jackhammers and cement saws that are laying down new roads and putting up new apartment buildings are a welcome noise in an American city that's been shrinking. They started noticing here that families were moving out of Tulsa when the population reached its highest in 2016 and went downhill from there. So it's become mission critical for Tulsa to turn this around. I'm G.T. Bynum. I'm mayor of the city of Tulsa. G.T. Bynum is the city's 40th mayor. He has a folksy voice, a warm smile, and a face that's framed by brown rimmed glasses. He was born and raised here and grew up on the white side of town. But he says he feels he owes it to this city to work for all residents. One of the key things that we've tried to do in the time that I've been mayor is recognize that North Tulsa has taken a backseat to the rest of the city from an economic development standpoint for decades. I mean, that's one of the main reasons I ran for mayor is the desire to close that disparity. And one of the big things that you can do is bring greater opportunities for great jobs and good employment. And with that comes development. On the north end of the city, you'll find the black side of town and the historic Greenwood District. It's also known as Black Wall Street. And to the families still here who haven't moved away, the sound of progress from the new buildings going up isn't nearly as delightful. You know, I absolutely hate the gentrification that's happening. Christy Williams is from a family that has lived here since the early 1900s. And she doesn't love seeing Black-owned businesses slowly replaced with high-rises, shopping centers, and a baseball stadium. She feels it's no accident that these changes are happening here, and also believes they don't pay any respect to the past. There is no empathy for that sacred land. There isn't, and people are just wanting to make a buck. But there's more to this. Over here, it feels like the city is trying to use concrete to cover this sacred land and bury a racist past. What we now know is that what took place on the streets 100 years ago was a massacre. And many of Tulsa's residents, many white residents in particular, have overlooked this for decades. I grew up here in Tulsa. My family's been here since the 1870s on my dad's side. And but somehow, despite his long family history, this city's mayor, like many others in Tulsa, got through most of his life without ever learning that a large black neighborhood in his hometown was a crime scene. And, uh, I first heard about the race massacre in 2001 or two. Uh, when I would have been 24 years old, uh, my cousin was running for mayor, and we were at a debate 
at the Rudisill Library in North Tulsa, and somebody mentioned at that that there had been a race riot where people dropped bombs from airplanes onto Tulsa. And I heard that, and I thought, that's ridiculous. I'm Steve Osinsami, and I'm a senior national correspondent at ABC News. For more than two decades, I've reported on some of the most important stories of our time. But this one really disturbed me, and I needed to know more. So I traveled to Tulsa to learn what happened to Greenwood, why it was kept a secret for so long, and to meet the people searching for answers today. Phil Armstrong, project director for the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission. Phil Armstrong is one of the black activists here who's trying to tell the story of how the people of Greenwood were killed. He says it often feels like he's pushing a rock uphill. He's originally from Ohio and graduated from a historically black college. Phil says it's no accident that the massacre is still, for the most part, a mystery. And he says that this historical amnesia is convenient for those who are responsible. You can hear his concern as he hits the table with his fists when he talks. Much of that had to do with historical trauma from white citizens who were shocked, embarrassed that this happened. And for years after, let's move beyond this. Let's not talk about this anymore. Let's just try to move beyond this point and kind of like, mm, let's not talk about this. Then on the black side, on the, you know, for those who uh, are survivors from the massacre for many years, you had this overarching threat that this could happen again. Over the years, it seems that most of Tulsa was able to somehow forget about this massive tragedy. Phil says that for Black Americans, it has always felt and still feels like a trauma or even a wound. It's almost like a, a post-traumatic stress disorder. They didn't want to talk about that with their children. And so a lot of the passing down of this was grandmother to grandchildren, grandfather to grandsons and within the community. But on an overt uh, level, it wasn't talked about for many years. It's a part of our history. Okay, so let's take a look at that history. The emancipation of slaves started a massive black migration in America. And many of those former slaves hoped to find their true freedom in Oklahoma. It hadn't yet become a state and was one of the few places in America where the boot of Jim Crow was not yet the law of the land. I think there are a couple of things that make Tulsa somewhat unique. One is Historian Hannibal Johnson is an expert on life in Tulsa in the early 20th century. The rapid transition from d dusty Western outposts to sort of rather cosmopolitan town based on the discovery of oil in 1905 Tulsa would go on to call itself the oil capital of the world. And that oil money generated a great deal of national attention. And it really created a migration to the, to the area. The other thing is the relationships or the interrelationships between Native Americans, African Americans, and European Americans. Those relationships were complicated, and we'll get to that in a bit. But first, we should try to understand how Black Americans ended up in Oklahoma in the first place. To do that, we need to go back and look at what the history books call the Trail of Tears. It was in the 1800s when the U.S. government forced five Native American tribes to leave their homes in the Southeast. So we're talking about the Cherokees, the Muscogee Creeks, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws, and the Seminoles. These were the tribes who the Europeans, in their great arrogance, thought were, quote, civilized. Some of them took on Christianity, spoke English, and even wore similar clothing to the white settlers. And despite all this, the U.S. government still violently forced them from their lands. Thousands of Native Americans died moving west, many of them on their way to the open plains that would become Oklahoma. And once those who survived were here, the government wouldn't let them choose where to live. They were told the government's policy was to divide up the land into what they called allotments. And those allotments were assigned to Native American households. And I should point out that this land belonged to Native American tribes who were already living in Oklahoma. 
in the end, it was because of these allotments that a good number of black families at the time were able to own land. And how that happened surprised me. Most people don't understand that all five of those tribes enslaved people of African ancestry. It's something that's not talked about much, that some of the Native Americans also owned slaves, even as they were being forced to move west. But some of those tribes agreed to something that would make a major difference for their slaves. Putting it simply, when the U.S. government freed every American slave, the slaves held by the Native Americans were allowed the same amount of land as their former owners. These black folks, who were called freedmen, they got land allotments too. And certainly in the late part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century, having land was an accession to wealth. So we had this sort of general uh, wealth floating around in, in what is now Oklahoma during this period. And then... Black Americans were now able to create their own safe spaces in the state. They called these all-black communities freedom towns. And there were more than a dozen of them in Oklahoma. Cities like Vernon, Redbird, and Bowley. But their greatest success in Oklahoma would be found in the city of Tulsa. The Greenwood District on the north side of town became the pride and joy of black America. It was a whole 35 blocks of contemporary homes, banks, and hotels. And they were all built on the black side of the railroad tracks that still divide Tulsa to this day. The Greenwood community as a business community was a community of necessity. There would have been no Greenwood community had there not been segregation, had black people not been forced to do business only among themselves. Uh, only in this insular economic island. Greenwood land on Greenwood began at Archer Street was sold to Negroes. That's the voice of Mazella Franklin Jones from one of early Greenwood's most successful families. They moved here when she was a child. She died in 1986 at the age of 79. Her father was a postmaster and one of the state's first black lawyers. Her mother was a teacher. Despite the discrimination that surrounded their world, the family did well enough to send her away to boarding school. It's an old recording, and sometimes it's hard to hear her words. In 1907, the Negro population was 638. She remembers black families moving here from Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, and Texas. They went from several hundred to several thousand in just 10 years. And I need to underline that this was a place where black people ran their own businesses, owned guns, and had surprising agency over their own lives. She says Greenwood had two movie theaters. Restaurant, we had about five, six restaurants. Hardware stores, a photography studio. Several bucks. And dress and suit makers. Historian Hannibal Johnson says it was a welcome change in what it meant to be black in America, even if this freedom still came with limits. In some sense, perhaps they were content because they have this uh, insular economy and they have a, a community in which they can thrive and sort of be themselves, yet they don't have full liberty because they can't engage in the, in the dominant economic or social community. So that's a problem. But let's step outside of Tulsa for a second, and outside of Oklahoma even, where white Americans across the rest of this country were in a much different place. After the First World War ended in 1918, the American economy was struggling, and many white Americans were looking for someone to blame. When you think about it, it's no accident that the Ku Klux Klan, America's foremost white supremacist group, became incredibly popular right after the war. This club of racists saw its membership grow from a few thousand to more than a hundred thousand as the economy went south. All of a sudden, KKK chapters filled with bitter Americans. They blame Negroes and immigrants for taking away their jobs. To many, it might sound a little familiar to what's happening today. Many in white America at the time were mad at anyone black. And the way many of them showed this was by hanging black Americans from trees. Years later, singer Billie Holiday would record a song that properly described the heartbreak and terror from those lynchings. The song Strange Fruit is on the list of the great songs of the century 
and is often described as the start of the civil rights movement. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging. It was an especially dangerous time to be black in America. Over the next decade, there were at least 27 lynchings of African Americans in the state of Oklahoma and more than 600 lynchings across America. And that's just what was written down in the history books. Hannibal Johnson says this period set the stage for what would come to be known as the Red Summer of 1919. They call it red because it was a bloody year. Racial violence spread across the country that year taking the lives of more than 200 black Americans. More than two dozen major so-called race riots throughout the United States in places we probably wouldn't think about, like New York, like Philadelphia, like Baltimore, like Chicago, like Memphis, like Omaha, Longview, Texas, Elaine, Arkansas, and I go on and on and on. So these these so-called race riots were happening all throughout the the country. The point simply of of the race riots and lynching as well was to reinforce white supremacy. Lynching is domestic terrorism. The point of lynching is simply to send a message to a particular group. Yes, it's it's to punish, often brutally murder an individual, but the greater point is to establish and ensconce the social order in which white supremacy is at, at is the foremost concern. Jealousy was a factor. If your philosophical mindset is that of white supremacy, then Cognitive dissonance happens when black folks are driving nice cars, there's a high degree of black home ownership, uh, black people are owning businesses. That simply is too much to be tolerated. You had white people in Tulsa at the time looking across the street and getting mad. And they weren't really trying to understand why these black Americans had to make their own economy. They were forgetting that if you were black, You couldn't try on shoes in their white-owned shoe stores or dresses and suits in white department stores. When Booker T. Washington, the civil rights pioneer, came to visit Greenwood in 1905, what he saw made him proud, and he called it Black Wall Street. Yeah, so I say that Black Wall Street is really a misnomer. I think a better moniker would be Black Main Street, because what really was here conglomeration of all manner of businesses. So barbershops and beauty salons, movie theaters, dance halls, pool halls, hotels, haberdasheries, restaurants, grocery stores, pharmacies, dry cleaners, service providers, doctors. It's all of this black success that was the fuel for the raging fires to come. And what would light the first flame is the story of a 19-year-old shoeshiner. His name was Dick Rowland. Commercial support for this podcast is provided by BetterHelp. For May's Mental Health Awareness Month and throughout June, Soul of a Nation is proud to join the cause of destigmatizing therapy. If you're struggling with relationships, having difficulty sleeping or meeting your goals, or feeling anxious or stressed, BetterHelp counselors can listen and help. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. Log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You can schedule weekly video, phone, or even live chat sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. So many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Our listeners get 10% off their first month of online therapy at BetterHelp.com soul. That's BetterHelp.com slash soul. There's another podcast we think you may like, Overheard at National Geographic a show that takes you to the edges of our big, weird, beautiful world. In the latest episodes, you'll swim with killer whales to observe surprising cultures, see how computer scientists are programming machines to recognize human diversity, and join scientists and historians determined to uncover the full story of the Tulsa Race Massacre.
Listen to Overheard at National Geographic, wherever you like to listen. So it's, it's Monday, May 30th, 1921. Dick Rowland, 19-year-old black boy, worked as a Shushan uh, boy downtown. We can't find any photos of the young man, but according to people who knew him, he was tall and played basketball at Booker T. Washington High. Remember, this is an oil town with an oil boom, and so a lot of wealthy oil men uh, whose shoes need to be shined and who tip well. So he's working downtown making a living. He needs to use the restroom. He knows that facilities are segregated in Tulsa, but he also knows that there's a restroom available for his use on the third floor of the downtown Drexel building. He walks over to the Drexel building on that morning, enters the building, boards the elevator. The elevator's being operated manually by a white girl named Sarah Page. Something happened on the elevator. We don't know exactly what it was. It caused the elevator to jerk or to lurch. Depending on who's telling the story, there was a scream. The elevator landed back in the lobby. Dick Rowland, frightened, ran from the elevator. There are many who believe what really happened is that he simply tripped and grabbed her arm while rushing to get to the bathroom. But to hear others tell it, it was an assault. Sarah Page then exited the elevator and she wound up in the arms of a clerk from a locally owned store called Renberg's. He comforted her. She was distraught. He was so concerned that he called the police. By the next morning, it was front page news in the papers. The media, particularly a a, a daily afternoon newspaper called the Tulsa Tribune that published a series of inflammatory articles and editorials that really fanned the flames of racial hostility in the white community. The news writers lovingly described the elevator operator as, quote, an orphan girl who was working to pay her way through school, but they weren't as kind to Dick Rowland. They described him as Diamond Dick. It was a really scandalous, uh, false narrative about an attempted rape in broad daylight in a public building in downtown Tulsa. They wrote that he was, quote, a Negro delivery boy who was lurking in the building for no reason before, quote, attempting to assault the 17-year-old white elevator girl. The Tribune article also went out of its way to make Sarah Page look virtuous. She was 17 years old, but she was a divorcee, which would have been scandalous at the time. By making Sarah Page look virtuous, the corollary is to make Dick Rowland look villainous. And the, the piece really had its desired impact in that it riled up white men in South Tulsa. A large white mob gathered on the lawn of the courthouse. The white mob grew exponentially. It wasn't safe to keep Dick Rowland in the city jail. Tulsa's sheriff decided to move him to a jail four blocks away in a cell on top of the building. He even kept the elevator holding on that floor on purpose. You have to realize that at the time, the idea of a black man even touching a white woman was considered attempted rape in America, and it could get you killed. And today, a hundred years later, there are some historians who believe that the two teenagers were actually a couple at a time when interracial relationships were against the law. Either way, Sarah Page refused to file charges. Now, Sarah Page ultimately would recant her original story, which is that she had been assaulted on the elevator. But by that point, it was too late. She could have shown them all the proof in the world that Dick Rowland was an innocent man, and it would have never been good enough for the angry white mob. Now, if you believe what they were saying that day, what they wanted was justice. But you don't have to look hard to see what they really wanted was revenge. Because this was a place where Black Americans lived differently than what most of white America believed was possible. And remember, many of the Black men in Greenwood owned guns. In fact, some of them raced down to the courthouse to try and save Dick Rowland's life. A number of black men were concerned for Dick Rowland's safety. They thought he was going to be lynched. There were rumors to that effect. Several dozen black men, some of them World War I veterans with weapons who knew how to use those weapons, marched down to the courthouse to protect Dick Rowland. There was now a chance of death in the air. There were too many guns. There was too much anger 
Their voices were too loud, and the white mob was too resentful. The white men went home to get more guns and more men. They were met back at the courthouse by a second group of black men shortly after 10 p.m. These men asked the sheriff if he needed their help protecting the black teenager. By all accounts, the sheriff said no. Words were exchanged between the large white group and the small black group. A white man tried to take a black man's gun. All of a sudden, a shot rang out. What happened after that first bullet was fired? Chaos ensued from there. The decades of silence that followed and the graves that stayed hidden for 100 years. There is, um, I think, a critical mass of evidence that strongly suggests that there are mass graves somewhere in Tulsa. And how in the world did Tulsa manage to keep a massacre a secret? In the next episode of Tulsa's Buried Truth. Tulsa's Buried Truth is a production of ABC Audio and the ABC News Investigative Unit. Written by me, Steve Osinsami. Reported by investigative producers Tanya Simpson and Jenny Wagnon Quartz. Produced by Susie Liu and Alexandra Myers. Music and mixing by Evan Viola. Our executive producers are Cindy Galley, Eric Johnson, and Liz Alessi. Special thanks to Sunny Hostin, Stacia Deshishku, Josh Cohan, Jin Sol Jung, Michael Kreisel, and Rachel Katz. Audio histories provided by the Tulsa Historical Society and Museum. Some sound effects were used to recreate historical scenes. If you haven't already, subscribe to this podcast and let us know what you think with a rating and a review. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is LG Granderson here to tell you about my new podcast from ABC Audio called Life Out Loud. This show is all about preserving the history and honoring the contributions of the LGBTQ community. Each week, I'll talk to some of the most fascinating people paving the way toward a more inclusive world. These conversations can get heavy, but this show is also going to be filled with so much joy. And I mean, after all, we are called gay people, right? So got to be some happiness in there somewhere. Check out Life Out Loud with me, LZ Granderson, wherever you get your podcasts.